Today I want to share with you three ways to make a gluten-free flour. An all-purpose mix, a whole grain mix, and a gluten-free flour that can be used as a cookie mix. Plus, I have a bonus gluten-free flour for those of you who like to have a self-rising flour for making biscuits. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary, and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel, and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now I've got lots of information to share today, but if at any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to open the description underneath this video where there'll be timestamps for everything that I'm going to cover. Now I want to mention to experienced gluten-free bakers, if you have a favorite gluten-free flour mix that you make or even one that you buy, be sure to leave the information in the comments below so that we can all learn from each other. And if you have any tips and tricks when it comes to baking with gluten-free flours, be sure to share that too. And I also want to speak to the beginners here, those of you who are new to gluten-free baking. I've received comments and emails from so many of you telling me that you don't even know where to begin or you've started but you've been so disappointed with the outcome of your baked goods. But I don't want you to worry. I'm going to share some very basic formulas here with you today that I think are going to help you be successful. But I also want to say that when it comes to gluten-free baking, in many ways it's not unlike fermentation. And what I mean by that is that gluten-free baking, like ferments that I've shared with you many times, can be very persnickety. But don't give up. You need to keep trying and experimenting until you get the results that you like. And sometimes it can be very simple as just adjusting the liquid in your recipe. If you bake something and it comes out dry, don't worry, record all of this in your kitchen journal and then the next time you go to make that recipe, add a little more liquid. Or if it's the reverse where it came out a little soggy, cut back on the liquid and keep track of all of these things. I am confident that if you keep track of your results after about your second or third baking adventure, you're going to start making great gluten-free baked goods. Now we're going to start going over all of the different mixes that I mentioned in the beginning, but I just want to tell you that in future videos, I will be using these mixes to bake different types of baked goods. And if that's something that interests you, be sure to check back at my channel to see when I've released those videos. You can also consider hitting the notification bell below that'll notify you when my new videos come out. And also, don't worry, you don't need to write any of this down. If you open the description underneath this video, there'll be a link that'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, where I'll have the recipes that you can either read online or print out for each of the mixes we're gonna talk about. Plus, I'll also have a download that you can print out or just look, download to your phone, whatever is most convenient for you, that can help guide you when you're baking with gluten-free flours or something that's very easy for you to take with you when you go to the grocery store. Well, let's get started. The first gluten-free flour mix that we're going to make is an all-purpose gluten-free flour. Now, this is great for using to make yeasted breads or quick breads. But the good news is you can also use this to make a sourdough starter, which is perfect for those of us who have a traditional foods kitchen. Because once you get that gluten-free sourdough starter going, you can then use that to make gluten-free sourdough bread. Now the ingredients for making this all-purpose flour blend are going to be rice flour, tapioca flour, and some potato starch. Now, I also recommend that if you can find this, adding some xanthan gum is really going to help with the texture of your final baked good. This helps with stabilizing and thickening, and so it helps create 
a better bread product. Now this used to be more difficult to find. However, with the popularity of gluten-free baking, you may be able to find this in your grocery store, as I did. This was right in the baking aisle, along with the various other flours and gluten-free flours. Now we're going to start with two cups of the white rice flour. And all you're going to do is just like if you were going into a bag of flour, you're going to put your cup in and then you're just going to do the lift and scoop method. So just as neat as you can, <laughs> just level that right off and then go ahead and add that to your bowl. Now I've got the two cups of white rice flour in my bowl. Now you may be wondering, can you use brown rice flour. Now that would turn this into more of a whole grain flour, which we're going to talk about in a minute. However, brown rice flour can go rancid very quickly. Brown rice is a very oily grain. So if you grind it into flour or you can find brown rice flour already made for you and sold at your grocery store, often the shelf life is very short. So for this simple all-purpose version, I recommend just using white rice flour. It's also going to give you a better result because it's lighter than brown rice flour. And when we move into talking about the whole grain flours, then we'll talk about some options that are not as oily as the brown rice, so they give your gluten-free flour, your whole grain gluten-free flour mix, a longer shelf life. The next thing we're going to need is one cup of tapioca flour. And we're just going to do the same lift and scoop and add this right into our rice flour. Now, if tapioca flour is something new to you, what this is made from is something known as the cassava root. And it's completely gluten-free. The root is dried and ground into a flour. And it's very digestible and it works wonderful for making gluten-free flour mixes. Now next, we're going to need one cup of potato starch. And we're going to do the same thing, just a lift and scoop. And we'll go ahead and add that potato starch right in with our tapioca and our white rice flour. Now you may be wondering, why are we making a homemade gluten-free flour mix? And the reason is that this is more cost effective than buying a pre-made gluten-free flour mix. And also what's nice about making your own homemade gluten-free flours is that in the long run, you may find that you like certain gluten-free ingredients more than others. And so you have more control over how you make your gluten-free flour. When you buy a pre-made gluten-free flour, it has all different things in it, and you're really kind of at the mercy of their whim, the manufacturer's whim, based on what they want to put in it versus what you want to put in it. Now, at this point, you could just whisk this up and bottle it up. However, if, as I mentioned, you can get this xanthan gum, it will help improve the final product. And all you need of this is two teaspoons. So one bag is going to serve you very well for making multiple gluten-free flour mixes. Now, I'm going to go over the prices of these different flours. However, I know that depending on where you live in the United States or around the world, prices do vary. And right now, prices overall are going up. Now this white rice flour is 24 ounces. That's one pound, eight ounces. And this was $3.10 at my local grocery store. And this tapioca flour, which is 18 ounces, which is one pound, two ounces. And this was, I have my prices over there, $3.07. And this potato starch is 22 ounces, which is one pound, six ounces. And this was $3.85. So all relatively reasonable. Now this xanthan gum is a little more expensive. This is an eight ounce bag and it was $9.26. But as you see, for every four cups of gluten-free flour that you're using, you're only gonna need to use two teaspoons of the xanthan gum. And on the side here, they say that there are 23 servings, but they're assuming a serving is one tablespoon. So since you're going to be using two teaspoons for your four cups of gluten-free flour, you're going to be able to get a little more than that. But I want you to keep in mind, 
I purchase these at my local grocery store and they're smaller bags which I definitely recommend doing if you're a beginner. However, if you're an experienced gluten-free baker, then you're probably buying these in larger amounts and you're getting a better buy. So for you beginners, as you become more experienced, definitely look at buying these, preferably maybe online, and being able to get these, get the cost of these down further. For example, this is eight ounces, the xanthan gum, and as I said, I paid $9.26 for this at my grocery store, but if you look online, you can probably find a pound of xanthan gum for maybe a little over $11. So definitely the larger quantities you buy, the more you can save. But I can't stress enough for beginners, in the beginning, buy small packages and experiment and see what you like. Now all we need to do is give this a really good whisk, whisking. <laughs> we want to make sure that everything is well distributed throughout. And keep in mind, different flours, different gluten-free flours, and this to a certain extent is true of any flour, may settle at different rates. So when you go to bake with this, if you're not using all four cups at one time, I recommend giving your jar a good shake or putting it in back into a bowl and giving it a good whisk to make sure that everything is well distributed. That's a tip that can really help improve the final product of your baked good. Now I like to store these gluten-free flour mixes if I make them in this amount. Now keep in mind you can double this, triple this, whatever you want to do. But I generally make small amounts of these because we're not a gluten-free household so I'm not using a lot of gluten-free flour mixes. So I just make about a quart's worth. In essence, four cups. <laughs> but I use a quart size jar to store this. And then it's got a nice tight lid and I store it in a cool dark pantry. And just to keep everything nice and neat here, I'm going to use a funnel. Now, what is the shelf life of something like this? The shelf life, really, for these type of gluten-free flour all-purpose mixes, can be about two years. What you want to do is, when you buy your white rice flour and your potato starch and so on and so forth, just check the expiration dates on the back of each of these various mixes. And that'll give you a very good indication of how long this is gonna stay fresh in your pantry. Chances are you're gonna be looking at at least a year and a half, possibly two years. And what I'll do is to make sure that I can get everything fitting in this jar because after you whisk it, you've kind of fluffed up all of the flowers, is to just periodically give it a little shake to help settle it. Now when you're ready to bake some yeasted bread or a quick bread, or muffins for that matter. Muffins are in essence sort of mini quick breads. All you're gonna do is measure out whatever your recipe calls for. So if your recipe calls for an all-purpose gluten-free mix, then you can go ahead and use your homemade all-purpose gluten-free mix. Now one tip I wanna share with you about using this gluten-free flour to make a yeasted bread is that if you use baker's yeast that you buy at the grocery store, whether you buy it in a package or in a block, depending on how much you're buying, that's gluten-free. However, and this is something that I've learned from a number of you, if you like to use fresh yeast that you buy at a bakery, you need to ask the baker if that fresh yeast is in fact gluten-free. And the reason is that sometimes fresh yeast in a bakery can become contaminated with gluten. So be conscious of that if you are going to use fresh yeast. Now one point I wanna cover because I do get quite a few questions about this. When I make mixes like this, whether it's the gluten-free flour mixes that we're making today, or some of the other make-ahead mixes that I've showed you in the past, like the brownie mix and the cake mix, all of those, and I'll be sure to link to those in the iCard and in the, um, in the iCards and in the description below. Many of you have asked me, oh, do I need to store my mix in glass? And the answer is no. 
You can definitely store your mixes in plastic and that's often what's asked. Can I store these mixes in plastic? And whether they're with gluten or they're gluten-free mixes, you can definitely use a plastic container like this or whatever you have on hand. You just want to make sure that it does have a relatively nice airtight seal and that it is food safe. And a container this size would allow you to make more of your gluten-free mix. Now, could you put your four cups worth in here? Definitely. The reason that I tend to pack it into a quart size canning jar like this is I like to just try to keep as much air out as possible to keep it as fresh as possible. Now, next we're going to move on to making our whole grain gluten-free flour. Now, are we going to make this particular mix with all whole grain gluten-free flour? No. Basically what we're going to do is take our all-purpose gluten-free flour but add to it to improve the nutritional profile. I'd be very interested in hearing from those of you who are experienced gluten-free bakers but I find trying to do a 100% whole grain gluten-free flour mix to not always give the best results to the final baked good product. In many ways, it's not unlike when you bake with 100% whole grain without sifting out some of the bran and the germ or supplementing it with a little bit of all-purpose flour to help lighten everything. So basically what you're going to do is go through the same process you did for making your all-purpose flour. You're going to add your two cups of white rice flour, your one cup of to tapioca flour, your one cup of potato starch, and then your two teaspoons of xanthan gum. So I'll go ahead and get my base ready right now. Alrighty, so I've got my base. Now let's talk about some of these different whole grain gluten-free flours. As to the prices of all of these, they really run the gamut. Some of them are going to be as low as $2.99 a package, like for example this chickpea flour, which is a one pound bag. This is about $2.99 at my local grocery store. And if you buy it in bulk, you can probably even get it for less than that. And then if you come all the ways up the price line continuum, <laughs> Then you get to quinoa, which is much more expensive. It's going to, at least at my grocery store, this is an 18 ounce bag, so a little more than a pound, but it was over $10. But quinoa is very high in protein. So if you're baking something that's very high in protein or that you want it to be very high in protein, quinoa can be a good choice. And this is what I really like about making your own gluten-free flour. As you're going to see when we go over these choices, you can determine how much of the whole grain you want to add and what whole grain you want to add based on what you may be baking. If you are new to gluten-free baking, I recommend that you start with just adding one cup of these different gluten-free flours that we're going to talk about to your base all-purpose mix. Then, as you become a more experienced gluten-free baker and you can monitor the results that you're getting in your final baked good product, you can start increasing the amount of whole grain gluten-free gluten flour that you add to your base all-purpose mix. Now, as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, the reason that we want to try to incorporate some of these whole grain flours into our base all-purpose mix is because it will increase the, nu the nutritional profile of your gluten-free mix and then obviously increase the nutritional profile of your final baked good. Most whole grains, whether they're gluten-free or not, add a lot of vitamins and minerals uh, like calcium, magnesium, potassium. They add the B vitamins. They add protein. So they do add a lot of nutrition to your base flour. Plus they add fiber. And fiber is often something that most of us don't have enough of in our diet. And scientists tell us the more fiber we have in our diet, often the healthier we are. So not unlike when it comes to regular baking, 
Baking with an all-purpose flour is going to be not as nutritious as baking with a whole grain flour. So over time, the more whole grains that you can incorporate into your gluten-free flour mix, the better. So as I said, the nice thing about using quinoa flour is that it adds a lot of protein to your gluten-free mix, which is very nice. And the nice thing about chickpea flour is if this is all you have and you don't have anything else, you can make such a wonderful gluten-free flatbread that's called, and I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's called a soca, a soca, S-O-C-C-A, and it's a wonderful flatbread and you can make it a little on the thicker side or you can make it very thin like a crepe uh, or a tortilla. So it gives you a lot of versatility and it's so nutritious. And I also want to mention again to beginners, if you are trying these different whole grain gluten-free gluten flours, buy them in small amounts because they all do have distinctive tastes and you're going to want to determine which tastes you prefer. Now, when it comes to amaranth flour, this has a wonderful, almost sweet, nutty flavor. So it's great if that's what you're looking for in your final break baked product. And it can be wonderful for quick breads. And I wanna mention that this whole grain gluten-free flour mix that we're making can be used, again, for yeasted breads or quick breads or muffins, as well as to create a sourdough starter and then make gluten-free sourdough breads. But specifically when it comes to making quick breads or muffins for that matter, some of these flours are a little nicer to use in with your all-purpose base than others. And specifically, I think amaranth is terrific. The mild yet little sweet, little nutty flavor works beautifully if you're trying to make a gluten-free banana bread or something along those lines. This also works very well when you're making a gluten-free cookie mix, which we'll talk about later. Buckwheat flour is another wonderful gluten-free flour to have on hand. However, when it comes to buckwheat, you need to make sure that you like the flavor. So I would recommend, again, buy a small bag and try making some buckwheat pancakes and see if you like the flavor. This has a little stronger, distinct flavor. And so there are people who don't like buckwheat. So better that you start small, make it with pancakes before you actually use it to make a gluten-free mix and see what you think of it. But Buckwheat is very rich in B vitamins, and B vitamins are very good. They really nourish our nervous system. And in this crazy world sometimes that we live in, nourishing our nervous system is a good thing. Now, I also want to talk about sorghum. This has a very nice, somewhat sweet flavor, not unlike the amaranth. And so this is a very nice flour to use, especially if you're making a whole grain gluten-free mix to use to make quick breads. This also works very well in the gluten-free cookie mix. Now I wanna mention, I just briefly talked about sort of the price continuum of these different flours. I'll go into more detail about what each of these cost me. Uh, on my website where I have the corresponding blog post for this video uh, so you'll know what the price range is but keep in mind you're going to start small but over time as you become more experienced and you know what you like then when you buy these in bulk they do become more reasonably priced but this bag of sorghum flour which is one pound, 16 ounces this was about $3.99 and it was even less buying the actual whole grain now, as I mentioned earlier, my grocery store I, has an amazing selection of gluten-free flours. I was really impressed. It's really changed over the last couple of years. But if you can't find sorghum flour, you may be able to find the whole grain sorghum. I actually found this not on the flour aisle, but in the aisle at my grocery store where they sell the rice and the grains and the beans, things like that. And then you can grind this up if you have uh, like a high-speed blender, or a little spice grinder, and you can just make your own uh, sorghum flour. You may be able to do it in a regular blender too, I'm not 100% sure, uh, so you'll want to check the manufacturer's instructions. Now millet is another whole grain that's gluten-free that you can use to add to your all-purpose base to make a whole grain gluten-free flour. 
Now this is millet flour and I actually had to buy this online because I could not find this at my local grocery store. But in the grain section, I was actually able to find whole grain millet. And like the sorghum that we talked about, you could grind this and make your own uh, millet flour. And I really like using millet flour because like some of the others we talked about, it is reasonably priced. Uh, this whole grain bag, which is uh, almost two pounds, one pound, 12 ounces, was about $3.99. And this is a two pound bag of millet flour. It was a little more expensive, but overall it's a reasonably, reasonably priced whole grain flour. Plus it also has a mild flavor. So it'll work well for making your yeasted breads or your sourdough or your quick breads or muffins, whatever the case may be. It really blends nicely and has a very mild, pleasant flavor. It's also a powerhouse of nutrition. It's got potassium, it has selenium, it has copper, it has manganese, niacin, thiamine, magnesium, zinc, and panathonic acid. I mean, it's just got so many nutrients in it that it makes for a wonderful, uh, basically make, turning your all-purpose mix into a very nutrient-rich gluten-free flour. It also has a pretty good protein profile. Quinoa, for example, has five grams of protein per serving, but millet has three grams, so it's nothing to shake a stick at, as they say. Now today we're gonna use millet flour to make our whole grain gluten-free flour, but there's a few other flours that I do wanna talk about here. One is cornmeal, which this is gluten-free, it's guaranteed gluten-free, and the other is oat flour. Now, if you saw my video uh, where I talked about uh, stocking a baking pantry, I, dis I did discuss this oat flour, which I wanna share with you, that I could not find anywhere on this packaging saying that they guaranteed it was gluten-free. Now, oats and corn are gluten-free, but sometimes the crops can become contaminated uh, from neighboring crops and have gluten in them. So when you're looking to be 100% gluten-free, you wanna make sure that you find something on the package, like this little red circle that Bob's Red Mill brand is popular for putting on, a little circle with GF in it, or the Arrowhead Mills puts it right across the front here, gluten-free. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at these other whole grain flours. But the nice thing about making a gluten-free flour, a whole grain gluten-free flour with corn, in this case, cornmeal, is that that makes a wonderful base for then making cornbread, a gluten-free cornbread. And it's like I said earlier, this is why I like making these things homemade, because you can tailor them to what, you can tailor your gluten-free flour mix to what you want to bake. So add some cornmeal, and now you have a wonderful gluten-free flour to make cornbread with. And oats, oatmeal, <laughs> oat flour is wonderful. And speaking of oat flour, if you have old-fashioned rolled oats, or if you have the steel-cut oats, or if you have oat groats, which is the full, you know, the actual full uh, whole grain oat, all of those can be ground into flour. If you have a grain mill, great, you know, for the oat groats, uh, high-speed blenders can do the job. And if you have the old-fashioned rolled oats, even just a regular blender can grind those into a flour. So it's nice that oats give you a lot of flexibility. And I discuss all of the, the corn and the, uh, and the oats in more detail in that stocking the pantry video. And if, so if that's something that interests you, and I do cover some gluten-free options in there as well. And I have a nice printout, a downloadable, and there's no email required or anything like that. So it's easy, you can print out or download it to your phone. And it's a great uh, resource for when you go grocery shopping. But oat flour can be great if you're making any type of bread, like an oatmeal pantry bread that I've shared with you in the past, and you wanna make a gluten-free version, you can add oat flour to your base all-purpose mix. Oat flour also, just because it has a very pleasant and mild flavor, can work well when you're using it to make a yeasted bread, a sourdough, or a quick bread. 
oat flour also works well as a base for a gluten-free cookie mix, of course, to make oatmeal cookies. So that's something to keep in mind. But we'll talk about the cookie mix in a minute. Coconut flour is another option, and this can work well if you want to add this maybe along with one of the other whole grain flours and the reason to your basic all-purpose base here. And the reason is, I will be very honest with you, and I'd be very interested in hearing from those of you who are experienced gluten-free bakers, I'm not a huge fan of coconut flour. I've baked with it a couple of times in the past, and I find that it just takes an awful lot of eggs to get the type of lift that I'm looking for. So definitely try it out, but if you've been using a lot of coconut flour and you've not been getting the results that you had hoped for in your gluten-free baked good, it may be time to try something different. Uh, but I did want to share with you that it is coconut flour is gluten-free, but I wanted to be truthful with you to share that I do find it a little challenging to bake with. So as we have did in the past, we're just going to do the lift and scoop with our millet flour. And if you're not familiar with millet flour, I think you're going to really like it. It has almost a very yeasty smell to it. And it's got a beautiful pale yellow color. Now, as I said, I'm just going with one cup this time around. But if you find that after you've baked with this, that you're happy with how your product is coming out, your final baked product, then by all means, you can go ahead and start adding in more of the whole grain flour to your basic all-purpose mix. So you just want to make sure that you whisk this really well to get all of that millet flour well incorporated. And when you go to use this, you're going to use it the same way you're going to use your all-purpose flour. If you have a gluten-free recipe that calls for a gluten-free flour mix that has some whole grain component to it, then you're just going to measure this as you would any uh, store-bought gluten-free flour that has a whole grain component to it. Now I'm just going to go ahead and decant this. Since I've got the five cups of flour in here, I'm going to use a bigger jar. Now I just want to talk about the xanthan gum for a minute. I have found that adding the two teaspoons, like we did when we made our first batch of all-purpose flour, is a sufficient amount of xanthan gum, even though we are adding this additional one cup of whole grain uh, flour, in, this, in our case, the millet flour. However, as you start to add more whole grain flour to your mix, you may want to consider upping the amount of xanthan gum that you begin to add to your original all-purpose base. And as you say you decide you want to add two cups of a whole grain flour or three cups of a whole grain flour, where you're starting to get to the point where you've got 50% of these lighter gluten-free flours and 50% of more of your heavier, your whole grain gluten-free flours, at that point, you will want to consider increasing your xanthan gum from two teaspoons up to four teaspoons. But again, you don't have to write anything down. I'll explain all this in the written recipe over on my website. Now let's move on and make our gluten-free cookie mix. Now for this mix, I like to use the tapioca flour, the sorghum flour, because it's got a wonderful flavor that I think works very well with cookies. And we're going to need a little xanthan gum again. And then I also like to use arrowroot. Now arrowroot is sometimes called a flour, sometimes it's just called a starch. You may know it either way. But basically what it is, it's something that comes from the arrowroot plant. The arrowroot plant grows tubers, you know, it kind of looks like a potato or a sweet potato, a tuber. And then the starch is extracted from that tuber and dried and you get arrowroot starch or arrowroot flour and it's gluten free. And if you have a gluten free household and maybe as we've talked about earlier, you're a beginner with all of this, arrowroot can really become one of your best kitchen friends. I'll just read to you a few of the things on the back of this package as to how arrowroot can help you in a gluten-free kitchen. It's an excellent grain-free substitute 
for cornstarch and can be used as a one-for-one -one replacement in most recipes. Arrowroot can also be used for thickening if you need to thicken a gravy or a soup or a stew. It can also be used as an egg replacement. All you'd need to do would be whisk together one tablespoon of arrowroot starch, a tablespoon of some type of oil, and a quarter cup of water to equal one egg. And it can also be a baking powder substitute. And this can really come in handy, just like the egg substitute, in the event that you don't have any eggs or you don't have any baking powder. You can take your arrowroot, in the case of making a baking powder substitute, and you can take one teaspoon of baking soda, two teaspoons of cream of tartar, and one teaspoon of arrowroot starch, and there you have a baking powder substitute. And arrowroot is great for adding to a gluten-free cookie mix because it helps with the crispness of the cookie. You may be familiar with the teething biscuits that are often seen uh, that toddlers are eating. They're generally made from arrowroot powder. So for making this gluten-free flour mix, do the same measuring the way we did with the other ones. Scoop, level it off, and right into your bowl. And here I've got two cups of the sorghum flour. And I'm using the sorghum flour because I think that it gives you the best results for a gluten-free cookie mix. But another whole grain flour I would recommend experimenting with for making a gluten-free cookie mix would be the amaranth flour. Now for the tapioca flour, we're just going to need a half a cup. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in with my sorghum flour. And for our arrowroot flour, our arrowroot starch, I often call it arrowroot powder as well, we're just going to need a quarter of a cup. I'll go ahead and add that right in. And for the xanthan gum that we're going to use, you only need a half a teaspoon for this gluten-free uh, flour cookie mix. And just like we did with the other mixes, we want to give this a really good stir whisk so that we get everything well incorporated. Now when you make cookies, or for that matter, a yeasted bread or a sourdough bread or quick bread or muffins, whatever the case may be, the recipe will often call for some salt, maybe some baking soda, maybe some baking powder, depending on what you're making. But these are things that I do not like to add into any type of mix like this, like a gluten-free mix that I'm making. I like to give myself the flexibility of when I'm actually going to use the mix to add those little additions that may need to be added, but to add individually to whatever specific recipe I'm following. Now this makes close to three cups of gluten-free cookie mix. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use my quart size jar. It probably is not gonna fill it, but that's okay, because it won't fit in a pint size jar, it'd be too tight. Alrighty, bonus tip for you biscuit makers. Now, although I said earlier, I generally don't add baking powder or salt to my gluten-free mixes, there is one exception. If you love to make biscuits and you know that you're going to be using your gluten-free flour mix to only make biscuits, then all you need to do is take your all-purpose mix and add two tablespoons of baking powder to it and two teaspoons of salt and mix it in with your all-purpose mix really well and now you have a wonderful self-rising flour, which is always a popular flour to use when making biscuits. Now, if you've enjoyed learning about these gluten-free flour mixes, be sure to ch click on this video over here, which is my full baking pantry video, where I go over a whole host of flours, including many gluten-free gluten flours. And I think you'll really enjoy it, so be sure to check that out. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.